This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast for the Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife Podcast as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, we're really glad to have you on board here, and so uh, we've been appreciating the success and the support that we've been getting from the industry, and we would love to have the opportunity for you to spread the word around for the work that we're doing. Our podcast is dedicated to helping wildlife control professionals. That's my segment, people that deal with vertebrate pest control, to help you improve your business and technical expertise so that you can be, improve yourself as a professional within this very diverse and I can't say fast changing industry, but it is a growing and maturing industry to be sure. So we're never going to be like cutting edge like technology per se. But uh, the industry is changing and people are developing and new skills and products are coming onto the market. So it is sort of an exciting time to be associated with the wildlife control industry. And so wildlife, for those of you that are more from a pest control world, we're looking at things that animals that have a spine. So if they have a backbone, that's what we're dealing with in wildlife control. So not your neighbor, not your ex-wife. We're dealing with animals, not people. So uh, uh, pe- people is a different part of the government and a different type of work. We're dealing with just animals here. All right. Well, this week's podcast or vodcast, I guess is what they're called now, I uh, wanted to deal with something that was really kind of puzzling me. Uh, so... I thought I should spend a few moments talking about how do you get on to the show? I have, uh, you know, I'm basically a producer and I'm a content provider. I kind of editor. I do it all other than posting it on the Pest Geek podcast. That's Franklin's uh, position there. So what I'm intrigued is when I reach out to people who are marketing on Facebook or LinkedIn or some other types of places where I come across their company, and I ask them, hey, do you want to be on the show? And I'm actually amazed at the percentage of people that are that go quiet. And so I'm thinking to myself, what in the world is that all about? So you are marketing yourself all over Facebook and maybe LinkedIn and some other places. But when uh, an organization like Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife, wants you to do a show on you, all of a sudden everything goes quiet or, or there's all kinds of questions. Uh, so I wanted to kind of address that because it's, to my mind, it's completely bizarre, but you know I have to be careful here because, as they say, an un- you know everything, everything is is strange to the to someone who is uninformed. So uh, perhaps I have been unclear about what our podcast is all about. So why people are afraid of it. So I thought I would make this particular podcast an explanation on what we do here how you go about doing it, what should you expect if you are producing a product, because we don't just simply go to people that are producing a product or a service, we also want to talk sometimes to just regular wildlife control operators, PCOs, who are in the in the vertebrate control space, and get their opinions on what's going on in the industry to kind of get that person on the ground uh, challenges that are occurring because we learn from each other, right? We're a very small industry, relatively speaking. And so we learn from each other because we don't have researchers dedicated to the concerns that we have. So we have to learn it on the fly and from each other. Okay, so, all right, let me start from the top then. Uh, The first issue, of, of course, that I'm struck by is the fear. Why are people afraid? Afraid of being on the podcast and so there's I think there's a couple of reasons that I've kind of gleaned from some of the comments that people have had the one one of them is well what do you want to talk about 
Okay, uh, well, I figured you're selling your widget. I would like to talk about your widget. But we can talk about other things if you want. I mean, it's kind of, I'm inviting you onto the show uh, to talk about the widget you've been advertising. And let's talk about your widget. How about that? And so, and what was bizarre is they'll, they'll be like, well, what's, what do you mean by that? Um, well, uh, talk, this is your opportunity to tell our audience about your widget and why it's good and why, how it should be used and maybe where it should not be used. Uh, so I'm kind of flabbergasted and you may, you may think, oh, Stephen, you're being sarcastic here. I, I'm really kind of flabbergasted by the fear of this. I mean, it seems like if you're gung ho about your product, why wouldn't you want to talk about your product to the industry that could possibly use it? Again, we're a small industry. I mean, we don't, we're not, you know, minuscule, but we're a small industry. But people purchase. I mean, I remember a while back, if you, you know, back in the heydays of Wildlife Control Technology Magazine, uh, when, I was, when I knew the editor, uh, it was Bob Noonan, I believe, at the time, and he, he was pointing out that though the circulation wasn't very high, I think their highest circulation at the time was probably somewhere around 5,000 people. That's not a lot when you think about it. But they said that when they talked to the people that advertised in their magazine, they got a bigger return on investment than other than publishing in the big bug killer magazines. Now think about that for a minute. It was cheaper to advertise in WCT and they had a bigger bang for the buck. Why? Because they were targeting an audience that was hungry for vertebrate pest control material. So, so yeah, we're a small industry. Uh, but you're, you're targeting people that are, that are dedicated to what they're doing. You're talking to the owners of those companies, right? You're talking to the people that make purchase decisions. So that fear element just really strikes me. So if, as far as the content is concerned, uh, you know, if you don't know your product, then I guess I would say, don't come on the show because that would be kind of silly, right? If you don't know your product, but I'm assuming that's really not true because if you took the time to manufacture your product and you're selling your product or service, you know that, you know what you're doing, right? So you are a professional and I just assumed that. So I'm a little struck by, and like I said, flabbergasted by the fear that people have, uh, about this. So I so I hope I've got the content issue out of the way. I think another fear is that people are afraid to be on camera. We do, it is true, we do use Zoom uh, and we want people to turn on the camera because it's a vodcast, it's video. There are situations in the earlier days of, the, of, our, of our show, we did everything audio. Now there are people that are very camera shy, and that's just that's just the reality of it. But the fact is, if you are, you know, paying attention and you're just doing your thing, once you get into the flow of what we're talking about, you ignore that the camera's even there. So I hope that that element is gets eliminated. I mean, does the camera make you look heavier? Yes, the camera, it is true, it makes you look like you gained about five, ten pounds more than what you are, what you are reality, right? So, uh, you know, that's what we can't do anything about that. That's just is what it is. But it does provide that human contact in the sense that you humanizes you, that the person at the other end is not just hearing you, they're seeing you and they're able to build sort of that connection about your particular business and your in your product. You know, I'm confident a lot of people in our business are not necessarily watching the show, but they're listening as they're going from job to job. I mean, I would certainly recommend it. I don't want you watching the video, folks, if you're driving, all right? Please don't do that. We don't want you to do that. However, uh, so I'm so the video side is not a big deal, but if you have a product and you're able to hold it up in front of the camera, that helps. You know, so we can do some things. So if you are that afraid of the camera, if that's why you're afraid to come on to the show and talk about your product to a wider audience because of the camera, 
talk to me, we can work something out. But I, I'm hoping that this is going to be enough to sort of get you over that fear hump. Like, it's really not that big of a deal. Okay, the camera is not that big of a deal. Perhaps the next thing that people are afraid of is they're probably afraid of me asking them what would be called a gotcha question. A gotcha question is a question that is sort of comes out of left field. Uh, they do it with with presidential candidates all the time, you know. So uh, if you're a presidential candidate, they'll ask you, well, who is the president of uh uh, Uzbekistan and the person may not know and they're like ooh he's not qualified or she's not qualified to be president okay so they don't know the president of Uzbekistan you know but a, a less of a gotcha question would be who's the president of Mexico you know, if you're going to want to be president, you would hope you would at least know who the leaders of Canada and Mexico would be, right? I mean, they border our countries. So that would be, see, that would not be a gotcha question. It may be awkward if you don't know, but it's not a gotcha question. A gotcha question is just, you know, give me the, you know, the, I don't know, the, the atomic weight of uranium. Okay, the, not relevant. I don't ask gotcha questions. That's not the purpose of our podcast is to try to humiliate you. My policy for running the podcast is I try to talk as little as possible as part of the being the host of the Living the Wildlife podcast. Now, those of you who have been following the show faithfully, thank you very much. I appreciate your support. Well, should verify that. I don't talk a lot when I have a guest. I try not to interject a great deal. The places when I do interject are areas of what I call safety, where we don't want people, I want to clarify something about maybe the law that I know about, or a safety issue, or to try to clarify an issue to be sure that there's no confusion about what we're doing. And that would be responsible as a host because we want, to the extent possible, we're not perfect, accurate, appropriate, responsible information going out over our podcast. My name is associated with it. My name means a lot to me. It may not mean a lot to other people, but it means a lot to me. Um, unfortunately, in my business, you have a lot of people that don't like you for whatever reason, okay? So I don't need to give them more reasons not to like me, but like providing bad information. So we work, you know, we, we endeavor to be accurate. So when I'm interviewing you, if you're on the show and I'm asking questions, I try very hard to ask leading questions to let you discuss your topic. If we're talking, I'm just going to say widgets because I don't want people thinking I'm talking about a specific person who's been on the show, right? We're, we're having a widget. Uh, tell me about your widget. How did you start your How did you start your widget business? How did you start? How did you get the idea for your widget? What makes your widget unique or special? What's the cost of your widget? How do people get a hold of your widget? How do they purchase it? Who shouldn't purchase your widget? Those are common, everyday questions that you're probably handling every time you're trying to sell your particular product. So why that is fear, fearful or why that causes fear among people, I am at a complete loss. Because what I found, it's sort of the same challenge I had when I used to be an editor for one of the magazines, uh, and I would try to get wildlife control operators to write articles for the magazine. Oh, I can't write. I had one in particular that I'm thinking of, and he says, and I asked him, well, you know, you came up with this really neat idea for holding bait. I said, why don't you, you know, write, up, write it up. Just be a, be a couple hundred words is all it would take. Oh, yeah, yeah, he'd say, I don't know. And it's like, look, it's really, just write it up. Just write it. Well, I don't, and he, so I emailed him, and he says, well, I don't know where, I don't have the first word. So I wrote back to him, the. 
And then he emails me back, well, I don't have the second word. However, you know, they say that, but if I talked to him and asked a couple of questions, I could get him talking for probably 10 or 15 minutes. No problem whatsoever. So it was basically, quote unquote, writer's block that he couldn't write it, but they could talk forever. And so when people, this is not a writing a writing context, this is an interview context. And I'm always amazed when people are afraid to come onto the show because I find that wildlife control operators and manufacturers are very, love talking about their product. They love talking about it. You Sometimes you can't get them to shut up. So if that is, so if you're, if you're, if, if you can talk about your product, why not talk about it on our show? Look, you don't have to come on to our show. It's your, it's your call. So that is your decision. But I, what I'm trying to overcome here is the, the fear of the show that somehow we're in the business of trying to trash the industry. That is not my business. Uh, that may be somebody else's business. Maybe go to the animal rights protest industry groups. Maybe that's who you want to go to if you're worried about that. I, I'm here to provide quality, accurate, helpful information that that assists our listeners into protecting themselves, protecting their clients, putting money in their pocket, improving their professionalism and expanding this industry and growing our, our industry. That's, that's the mission. That's my mission. And I would assume Franklin, I'm not going to speak for him say, but my, but my belief is he would love his side of the industry. He's more into the plant side and the insect side than I am. That he wants the same for those industries as well. He wants the industry to mature. He wants people to be successful. I want people to be successful. So, uh, and I would hope that if you're a producer of a product or a service that you think is important for the industry, that you want to improve the industry too and make money. Okay. I, I, I tell, I tell the people that I interview right off the bat, we are capitalists. I am not afraid of you making money. Okay, this is, we are not communists, we're not socialists. We believe that people that earn, that make a living, deserve to keep that money. Okay, so when you come onto the show and we're talking about a product, I hope you're going to sell your product on the show. Now, the difference is going to be, it's not going to be just a, an infomercial, now, let me explain the difference for that is. So I want you to talk about your product. I want you to talk about its features. I want you to talk about how people use it. I want to talk, have you talk about how they can get a hold of it. But it's not just going to be my product is the best thing that God ever created since the dawn of time. I will ask a question or two that explores what the limits of that product is. So... Let me explain. I, I When I was writing for that national magazine, I was trying to do a story on a new beaver trap that was produced out of Canada. And it was a uh, box trap. It was a cage trap, actually. And it had a kind of a clamshell design. And, uh, you know, I was interested in it, so I figured, well, it's a new product. I, I, I'm a writer. Let's write about a new product. So I was con in contact with one of the distributors. Nice guy. And he sent me some information. And so one of the things I asked him was, I said, well, every trap has its limitations. What are the limitations of this trap? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you can't use a trap everywhere. Where should you not use this trap? Or what is this trap not good for? Oh, he said, I, I don't know. I, I'll have to ask the manufacturer about that. He's pretty sensitive about that sort of thing. And I was like, what? So he contacted the manufacturer and got back to me and said, well, um, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I don't, we're not just, I'm not comfortable getting into that. And so I was puzzled. I'm like, I'm thinking you, 
you can't say one thing that your product doesn't do. And I ultimately, the story didn't get written. Now think about that for a moment. If I have a truck and I'm trying to sell you my truck and you ask me the question, what can that truck not do? And I would say that truck cannot carry 10 tons. Is that a negative of that or is that just a fact about it? So for that manufacturer to tell his distributor that he couldn't say anything that could per, 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 possibly per, be perceived as negative, he couldn't say it. I thought, that's just ridiculous. I, I'm sorry, that's just stupid. I, lo I love footholds, but footholds are not the device for every situation. Sometimes a cage trap is a better choice. Doesn't mean footholds are bad just means it's not the right choice for that point. It's like, what's the difference between a hammer and a screwdriver? Oh, well, you know, I can't, I can't say anything negative about the screw, about the hammer because I sell hammers and can, well, can a hammer drive a screwdriver? Oh yeah, you hit it hard enough, it's going to drive that screw. Really? If that is the type of manufacturer you are, then perhaps you're right, this show is not for you. I just find that silly. I am not out there to try to trash your product, but I will ask the question. It, the question will come, unless I forget it, what, who, sh, who is not the person for your product? Because the reality is, whether it's a piece of software, whether it's a business model, whether it's a, a trap, or whether it's a tool, chances are there is someone in our audience that this product is not going to be the best fit for. And if you come in with an attitude that sort of like your product is God's gift to humanity, then perhaps that's a level of arrogance that just won't fly. And I, but I suspect most of you don't do that. So again, that, if that's what the fear is about, well, then if you sort of check your ego at the door and you have a realistic expectation of your product and you know what it does and what it doesn't do, you'll, there's nothing to fear here. Now, perhaps another issue of fear that may come about it, and that is I've been in the wildlife control industry space for decades at this point. So there are going to be things I'm going to ask you about if you come up with something that I'm going to probe about the research that has been done on it and that may be anecdotal research and so that is something where again I'm, we're not looking at gotcha stuff I'm not going to try to humiliate you on the show that's not the purpose of our show but if that's if you if you know in your heart that this product isn't as good as you're claiming it is well that's going to be a problem as well we want you to be positive about your product, but we want you to be have a realistic expectation about your product. Let me give another analogy in that, and that is, I'm, I'm sure you love your children, but you know which children are gonna be rocket scientists and which children aren't. Doesn't mean you love them any less. It just means that not every, not every child is a brainiac and not every ch child is a football star. Everyone has their individual gifts and abilities, but they're still valuable. And I think that kind of humility in when we're talking about things is helpful because you may find that coming on the show, you're going to get a wider sales audience and you're going to get feedback from your users that make your product even better. All right, let's move on. What type of topics do we want to cover in the Living the Wildlife podcast? Well, anything related to the control and management of vertebrate pests. Anything. That goes from equipment to pesticides to repellents to uh, unregulated type products, traps, physical tools, habitat modification, all of that. We want to cover any of those particular topics. 
Second, business. Anything that helps our constituents deal with marketing, running the day-to-day -day operations of their business. Maybe there's particular types of policies and you know HR issues that they're involved with, taxes, laws. That is all fair game in this particular business. I would love to have a financial advisor on the show because one of my particular passions is that I'm afraid that a lot of people in wildlife control are not properly preparing themselves for retirement or, God forbid, injury. I think physical wellness is an important topic for our wildlife control operators. It's been good to see a lot of guys out there. Sorry, ladies, I know there's a few of you, but most of it's a male-dominated field. I see a lot more concern about taking care of your body because, let's face it, wildlife control is a very physically demanding job. You're throwing ladders around, you're climbing on roofs, it requires a, a level of physical dexterity that is important to keep going. It's hard if you're overweight to do all that, okay, depending on what type of work you're doing. We also want to get into the research side of things. So I will have on guests, and I've been gratified by the number of researchers we've been able to have on the show. I think researchers appreciate it because they're getting known, because uh, their information's often lost in academia because they're talking about things that most academics aren't caring about, and certainly their universities don't care about. So, But that's information that can help us do our particular job better. So I will bring on researchers uh, and have them talk about the research that they're doing because it's something that can help broaden your understanding of animal behavior, uh, animal uh, biology, maybe some disease issues, uh, the techniques that sometimes come out of a research environment. Uh, that can all be very, very helpful. And then finally, politics. Politics in the sense of how are we as an industry trying to defend ourselves against the animal rights protest groups. And unfortunately, uh, as I said in the earlier podcast, this issue is growing all the time because as more and more people think that animals are pets uh, or family members now or fur children. So it used to be pet, it used to be a working animal, then it became a pet, and then it became a uh, family member, and now it's a fur child. Uh, so this is the kind of attitude that people have toward their animals, and I argued, and sometimes tongue-in-cheek, sometimes not, that people love their pets more than they love their children. Now, they probably wouldn't admit it, but certainly by their behavior, it's probably true. That's impacting our industry because we're having people who were, they need wildlife control services, and they're like, well, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to kill it all? I don't want to hire you. That's a problem. And so we have people moving animals all over the place without adequate understanding of what's happening to the environment with all those translocated and relocated animals. And those of you that follow the show know that there's a difference between translocation and relocation. So those are the big topics, you know, think of it as business, control methods and techniques, Politics insofar as how we are regulated by government entities. We're not really getting into Republican, Democrat, that sort of thing, although that's an important topic in and of itself. That's not really the focus of our show. But we're interested in the politics that has it affects our industry directly. And then lastly, probably physical health. So we have control methods business issues, research, physical fitness, politics. I hope that helps. We are, so if those of you who are interested in being on the show, you may have a product, reach out to me, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. We don't want you to be afraid of coming on the show. I mean, if you're a shyster, don't come on the show. <laughs> but if you are selling a product or a service, or if you have research involved with areas of wildlife management, uh, even 
biology, disease, we're interested in because wildlife control covers an incredibly broad area. Just think of repairs. Because a lot of times we have to repair the, the damage caused by the animals that have caused in, that have been entered the structure. That's we're interested in that. Uh, so we have a very broad mandate. My desire is to let you as the guest take the center stage. It's not about me. I get very irritated when I listen to podcasts and the host is doing all the talking when he has a guest. It irritates me to no end because I'm not interested in hearing how smart the host is. I want to hear about the guest. So that is my philosophy. Other people have different philosophies. My philosophy is to try to let you shine and focus on your product or service. So I will ask leading questions to try to elucidate. So if, you, if you're giving me one, ans one word answers for a, an answer that I've sort of said, well, tell me about your past, boring. That's gonna make a very difficult interview con conversation. And we're generally looking for about a half an hour show, but I've gone, as you see, when I worked with Neem out of the University of California, we did an hour and a half. So I'm happy to go longer. If the, if the material just keeps coming forth, we'll make it a long show. So this is an opportunity, and I hope you reach out. All right. My name is Stephen Van Tassel. I am the host of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Thanks for listening again. Make sure you subscribe, reach out to us on Facebook, join our community, the Pest Geek Podcast. I would love to hear from you as well, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. And hey, let me just put a little advertisement here. A lot of you have photos. I am definitely interested in buying photos. You can get some ideas of what I'm looking for by visiting my website at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. I'm not buying ownership of your photos. You're always going to be the owner of those photos. I'm just buying the right to use those photos. And uh, if you have a logo, I, I will watermark your photo so that you will always be sure that you're getting credit for that particular image and so I pay anywhere from about 10 to 40 dollars a photo depending on what you have and the quality of it if you are also performed for some services so if you have photos you would like to have watermarked reach out to me we can work out uh, that sort of pricing schedule I would just need uh, your clear logo or the information if you don't have a logo I can just put your business name on them and we talk about where you want it on your on your photo and I can do that as well time to protect your information and photos because photos are so important stay tuned I'm looking to do another podcast on how to take better photos with your cell phone camera it's not as hard as you think but it's not as easy as you think either because unfortunately some of you take a lot of photos and they're not just quite as good as they should be and we'll talk about why that is all right enough for today they've gone my half an hour or so Again, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife. And why do we want you to live the wildlife? Because we don't want you to be the wildlife. Take care.